So the invitation is to uh, take that object in your hands and uh, whatever you need to do to make connection with that object in your own individual way, that's absolutely up to you. That might be poking it, that might be naming it, that might be not moving at all. But just bring your attention just to your hands, to your palm, to your fingertips, and just maybe hold it for a while, for a moment. Uh, we go for about um, five minutes or so, a little bit longer maybe. And the invitation is, it doesn't matter how fast you go, to slow down by half and slow down by half again. And I imagine each one of you knows what we're looking for, this tinglish pleasant sensation there on your skin that works when you go really slowly with very little speed. And you either move your hands over the object or you move the object with the other hand over the resting hand and just experiment and explore a little bit different areas you might haven't touched yet. Maybe between your fingers, your palm, fingertips, nail bed, whatever is appealing to you. And when you find a spot somewhere in your own exploration, then I invite you to stay there for a moment and just, just feel. Without any goal, just because you can. You experiment in your own way with your eyes open or your eyes closed, whatever works for you. Just bring all your attention to this pleasant sensation there in your skin, in your hands. Any feelings coming up, welcome them. If you're having any thoughts coming up, bring attention straight back to the sensation in your hands. So all thoughts are welcome. That's what the mind does.
Mm. Slowly and gentle, slowly your movement down till you stop. Stay there for a moment. And just notice in your body how you feel right now. Mm, gentle in your own speed, your own time. I invite you to opening up your eyes, orient yourself somewhere. And slowly bring your attention back to the screen. All right, so um, actually today is a monthly Monday and um, normally I've prepared a little bit if there are new people coming in, what's not happening today, um, except you, Ingmarie. So I will see how I just like um, cook that up, what I'm doing. But what came up first was um, I had a session with a client in the beginning of the week and we had a conversation about that and he talked. It's like, hey, Matt, he said, can you imagine or can you um can you can you think that ai can actually um allow people to dive into consciousness <laughs> i said i don't know you can just check it out so i just took um this question and put that in chat gpt and pointed in and said hey so can you tell me um, how I find consciousness. Can you explain that to, to me? And then da -da 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 -da, just like write something out and said, just like, yeah, you just put everything into the future. I have to find a space and I have to sit down. And I have to do this now. So what can you tell me right now that I can do? And it said, just like, uh, yeah, just um, close your eyes and uh, connect to your breath. And <laughs> so, so it was just nice. But then in the moment I said, just like, yeah, but then I have to read and when I read I can't really fully focus then I'm in my mind and then I asked the question so how how can the hand exercise the hand meditation help people to wake up and so this is kind of tailored and suit on my personal account and then it just brought a really interesting kind of thing about that and then I said oh that sounds really nice can you explain that on an emotional and neurological level based on the hormones and neurotransmitter and so it's like yeah sure <laughs> so i just wrote something down and if you would like to get that i can it's it's a really nice pdf and i can put that in the academy so if you want to read that it's really really interesting so if you want to share that with people why is this hand thing so so efficient so it's really nice laid out and uh, um and I was putting it as well on my Facebook wall because I was just asking a question there. It's just like, why does people not do or, or, or no, I asked the question, why do you or what do you like about the hand meditation or the hand exercise? Because I had a, the, the last few weeks, a few people saying, just like, Matt, why are you doing that? You're just riding on this hand meditation like crazy. And it's just like, it is people are bored and i was explaining that a few times what that boredom is why people are getting bored when they do that and um um and i was thinking and talking about the benefits of activating the hands in relationship to the feeling center and how that neurologically creates new pathways in the nervous system so that we literally feel more not only in our hands but everywhere in the body and how beneficial that is when we literally feel something that is not based on the story that we have running when this is based on an on the stimuli on the somatic experience because it just allows us to to dive much deeper into um, our capacity to yeah, evolve and explore and discover and um, so that was just a little bit of bloody bloody blah, blah, blah why and how using the hands but um i have a question to you today 
Um, is there anything that you would like to discover, explore, have questions about, anything that you would like to know? Maybe some of the maps or something on an emotional, neurological, physical, spiritual level or whatsoever. So please let me know. And I have kind of prepared um, the polyvagal theory, how the nervous system works. And if you would like to see that, I'm totally happy to break that down for you. I think that responding on an emotional level is pretty much dependent on the level of safety that you have. And if you are in an environment that you feel relatively safe because there's a container that is well held and you feel comfortable with the facilitator and with the people around you, then of course it's much easier and goes, goes much faster. Yeah. Um, I have sometimes um, independent from the environment's uh, access to my feelings. So for example, I can sit in a restaurant in public in the metro and I have overwhelming feelings and I have a cry. Yeah. And I don't really care about that anymore if people see me, if I have an emotional expression. And um, I have learned for myself that it's my responsibility more or less to, to create the container that I want to have that I feel relatively safe. But if I don't feel safe at all, so if there would be a kind of a threatening situation, I probably would have not opened up in situations like that. What I, what I feel has been really working well for me is, um, and you find that, uh, I don't know if it's in the course, uh, I think it's in, in, the, in the relationship course, about the um, numbness bar. And uh, in the numbness bar is literally a dynamic that explains that we all have a certain level of numbness in our nervous system and our emotional body that um, we have learned kind of just like to shut it down and not feeling it. And that we have this level up to, I don't know, 60, 70, 80% sometimes that we have to go into feeling that we actually start noticing that. And the way how I would describe that as part of an emotional intelligence is kind of over time to lower this numbness bar and start feeling earlier what's going through my system. And when I start feeling it, so the, the four main feelings like uh, anger, sadness, uh, grief, and fear, um, I speak it earlier when I feel it. Oh, I feel sad. Just, just a little bit. But if I would feel this 80, 90% of sadness, I probably would cry or just like go in an, in an, in an um, kind of ex more intense expression of that. But the, but the challenge is kind of expressing my feelings when they come up much earlier, even if I just feel that a little bit. And what I have noticed about this hand exercise is because this is connected to the feeling center, the more I do that and the more I practice that, the more I have access to my feelings and on a much e earlier level. Yeah. And some people say just like, yeah, well, this is just all nice. It's all good. So it's about pleasure and it's nice and joy. It's the good feeling. Um, but I don't want to have the other ones that I don't like. And then I say, just like, yeah, good luck. You know, when you dive into that and you want to feel more or you want to be more in connection with your feelings, that doesn't mean you have always only good feelings. It means we have all feelings. But then it's the question, how do you deal with them and where and how do you take ownership of them? And an important piece is, um, and you probably remember that from the training when I said that, uh, there is a different distinction between emotions and feelings. Mm. Yeah, so the emotions is everything that is from the past that just wants to be expressed. So it's just like it just needs healing, sometimes therapy. 
but feelings is dealing with what is now yeah and you know having a functional numbness bar is not wrong or bad you know when you take the four core emotions or feelings and you take anger and you really pissed off with something where it's not appropriate to be pissed off mm. it's just good to just like sit on it for a while just like okay i'm just i could just explode but i will do it later so you, you had some like, some drawings, right? so you would like to have the more explanation about the shadows yeah that's an interesting dynamic and uh, I'm, I'm talking about the, di the dynamics of the shadows um I'm, I'm just right now preparing a webinar you know i'm just like um trying to just like get people into the dynamics of that and then people say so what are these shadow di things about and um so when you when you look into the shadows you can just like look at from the psychotherapeutic perspective you know survival mechanisms but when i'm talking about the shadows within the diagram of the somatic consent engagement system it is based on when we engaging with other people and we um want to have an encounter that is meaningful and we have not asked for what we want or we have not expressed our limits so if you want to have a look into your own shadows, the best way of doing it is you just make a list for yourself. Why don't you ask for what you want? Yeah, and just make a list, 10 things that come into your mind. And when you um, have a list of 10 things, why don't you ask for what you want? Then do another list. What are you doing instead of asking for what you want? And the same thing, you can do that about your limits. Why don't you express your limits and why don't you say no? Why is it difficult for you to express your limits and say no? Make a list, write 10 things down. And then make another list. What are you doing instead of saying no or expressing your limits? And then you have your main shadows when it comes to human engagements. And then, of course, we can do a lot of healing about that. Why have we done that? Why, where have we learned that? What is the first impulse? Where it's all from? And you can dive really deep into that. But I like this saying from Buckminster Fuller is, you don't change an existing system by fixing it. You create a new one that makes the old one obsolete. Yeah. And this new system is literally that you ask for what you want. And you just do that in little steps. Practicing that with the three minute game make stuff really simple and easy. Can I be direct? Yes. Okay, so we have been talking about your shadow on the other side. So it's this kind of this, the pleasing a little bit home there, right? Yeah. yeah. So the, the, the provider, just mm -hmm. like you just want other people to be happy and you just like do good stuff that other people, you, you educate. Yeah? Yes. Um, I wouldn't say it's a shadow in per se. It's, you know, this is the main structure we have all learned to fit in. You know, this is the good girl, the good boy behavior. We just like, we just become really um, uh, uh, assertive to other people's needs. Yeah. Yes. And, um, and we wouldn't question that. And then we then there is on the other side, you know, people who take full advantage out of this. Yes. And I explained it uh, the other day uh, to a friend where 
this taking advantage is that they make you believe that they do you a favor that you can serve them and that you can still say thank you for your serving them and they make you even believe that you maybe can even pay them for what you did <laughs> yes yeah mm -hmm. so but you are so home in this in this other side you you're so far away from being in this position mm -hmm. So, so, so that's so, why I don't recognize it and understand it. <laughs> yes, I, I guess so. <laughs> it's it's just like it, you you can't you can't see it because you're so on the other side. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. imagine I imagine you're so on the other side is that you know how to ask people for what you want or you express your limits to a degree, saying just like or you respect somebody else's limit or when you see somebody has a limit. You wouldn't dare to ask or you just think i do it myself before i ask but i can't yep. ask but just now for a second just put yourself into this position yeah put mm -hmm. yourself in the position you just like the queen on a throne yeah and you have your minions around you everywhere and your minions are about to serve you they have to do everything that you need and you don't even need to say anything because you um, have the privilege that they know what you need they know on which time of the day you need to have your food and they come and clean around you and and you you don't even need to say anything you just look somewhere and somebody jumps and does it directly yeah 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 so so it's the it's the it's the shadow of privilege entitlement exploitation slave ownership yeah. um, um the pillow starfish the uh um uh you know there's so many different expressions around that so so yeah. but this shadow can only exist with the other shadow on the other side yeah yeah if i let it exist Right. And if you don't yeah. do it, they find another one and, and, and you're the bad you're the bad person. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> because they yeah, I understand. Yeah. One of the deepest spiritual shadows that I have found in there is um devotion to the master. Yeah, you you you, you just see what your master needs, what your master wants mm -hmm. for their benefit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you're not feeling comfortable serving the master in the right way, then you are in resistance and you have to do more work on yourself. Just imagine you there on the throne and just like, yeah, I'm ready to be served. Do it, do it very well or I fire you. You know, the great thing is that about the shadows there, you know, they're not wrong. They're just like adaptive mm -hmm. survival mechanisms. And we all have them yeah. and we all need them. And instead of kind of just like making them wrong and giving ourselves the yeah. whip is making them making them our superpowers. All right, you're ready for the polyvagal theory? So I just want to say a few things about this polyvagal theory picture that you see here. It looks like, what is that? It's a super complex. Uh, you don't need to understand that as it is there, but I will go through it and I explain it to you and then you understand it super easily. Yeah. So I want to say a few words about that. I um, came to the polyvagal theory in 2014 or 13 or something like that. And um, I read the book from Stephen Porges twice something like that and then i met him in a, in in two um symposiums and did one workshop with him and and then and then i just it just clicked so uh, when we're talking about the nervous system the important piece is that most people talk about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic 
And this is true, there is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic when we are born. Yeah, where the sympathetic is, you know, you cry, you scream, you move, you do something um, because you are either um, on survival mechanism, you're hungry or you die and you need to be fed or you sleep and that's parasympathetic. Yeah, so when we're born, it's pretty much true, it's sympathetic, parasympathetic. But then when we evolve, and that mainly over the first year of our existence, we developing our social engagement system. And the social engagement system is something like a myelation around the parasympathetic that allows us to engage with the world. Yeah. So the social engagement system doesn't exist when we're born. It's getting developed in the first year, so it creates a foundation. And the foundation of the, of the engagement system is built on oxytocin. Yeah? The way how we bond, the way how we feel, the way how we connect, the way how we love and being loved, you know, all this, this is the main thing, how this myelation is literally getting activated. And then this is building the foundation in the first year of our existence. And then we're just like building on top of that layer after layer, year after year after year, till we somehow in our mid thirties and in our adolescence. And then this thing is existing. It's so hard to change, you know? But the main thing, if you wanna change it, you change it through oxytocin, <laughs> through connection, through feelings, through being in bond with other people. Okay, so starting with the social engagement system. So the, the social engagement system is everything how we engage and connect with other people, eye contact. Yeah. So the social engagement system, so the myelation, so the ventral vagus or parasympathetic is everywhere from our um, upper diaphragm connected to our lungs, to our heart, to our larynx vocal cords, to our jaw muscles, to there's, there's a, a middle ear muscle here, to our eye muscles, how we taste, how we speak. So everything, how we socially engage with other people. Yeah? And the social engagement system is detecting if you are safe or if you're not safe. In this terms of a nervous system structure, it calls neuroception. So you just, feel safe or not safe. So um, then you have in this dynamic, um, the sympathetic and the dorsal parasympathetic. Yeah, so it's kind of in six different uh, fractions are there. So let's go in the first part in the not being safe. So this is where on social not safe, dynamics of oppression, storytelling, lying, manipulation, power over, everything that we just need to talk our way through it. Yeah. This is uh, the social engagement system where, we, where we're not feeling in connection, not feeling safe. When um, we're getting triggered and you know stuff is getting more dangerous, then we're switching from, from this side here, not being safe, into this sympathetic fight flight response. So we just wanna run away, or we just like, we're fighting, or we're hiding, or we're going away. And that is between social engagement and fight flight, something going on that calls the uh, vagal break. Yeah, so when, when we're going from social engagement into sympathetic, our brain switches off. We can't make a conscious decision. We're blacking out. Everything that we wanted to say or need to express is gone. And all what we want emotionally, energetically, we want to get away. Yeah. So this is sympathetic fight, flight, or hide response. It's literally a survival mechanism and uh, is associated with danger. 
if you can't get away out of the situation, so if you can't run, if you can't flight, if you can't hide, there is between them two the so-called freeze state. So you are on a fight flight mission and you just want to hide at the same time. And this is where you have one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake where you just actually, oh! And the next thing is just shock, faint, collapse. So you just, is a breakdown. And this is, um, well, this is not, so so it's, it's literally, you know, when people are um, shut down, this is created in our nervous system that we don't feel pain when we get eaten by a tiger. Yeah, so when, when you literally have an impact and you have a crash, and you wonder why you haven't felt anything is because your nervous system has been shutting down before your rational brain could notice something. Yeah, so it's a well-designed survival mechanism. But important to say is that this line here, this middle line, is detecting it between not safe and being safe. Yeah. So wherever you go, when you do, for example, um, a workshop somewhere or a training or an or a, or an event i would say in most cases these events are designed that you're feeling safe however it might happen that your conditioning telling you that you are not safe and you actually feel like you just want to run away here or there are people that you detect from an experience from the past where you feel like I'm not comfortable with them, yeah? But in general, I would say when you go to an event where you want to meet people, it's relatively safe. So you can determine and detect if something is safe, if you can make choices, if you can make choices about the experience that you want to have. You can say no, you can say how you want that, you can say what your desire is, you can make a time frame, you can say yes to this, but no to this. So you, you, you are in a position of choosing and making decisions. Yeah? And then you make a decision and then you go as well in sympathetic. So you can run, you can, you can um, dance, you can do all kinds of things in sympathetic. So sympathetic when you save is called mobilization. So everything that is fun when you're going in action with your body is mobilization, is sympathetic. And people think, well, sympathetic is wrong because sympathetic is only fight and flight. No, it's not true. Sympathetic is as well going in action and being mobilization and mobilization when you're feeling safe. And you know, everything that you love to do with your body, swimming, lovemaking, everything that is fun is based on mobilization and sympathetic. And, okay, I said that already. And if you have exhausted yourself and you have brought yourself in a position where you have kind of give everything that you had, you had a good workout, you had a good dance, you had a good swim, you had a good run, you had a good you know, play fight, you are just like a good lovemaking or whatever has happened, you go from there in dorsal parasympathetic and then calls immobilization. And immobilization is super important because it's rest rejuvenation. And it is, um, I call that the bliss state. So this is where you sleep, where you recover, where you reboot, this is meditation. When you literally sit there with an object and feeling it, you are kind of in micro movement, but you're pretty much in immobilization, but you're fully aware. Yeah. So this is where you, it's, it's this, in the nervous system, it is the hardest place to reach because it's the most vulnerable place. So by saying that, it's super easy to go from this immobilization state, for example, into faint and shock. 
So if you are in immobilization and you have the experience somewhere in your life that being immobile is you are fragile and you are in danger and something is happening, you know, whatever it is, somebody is saying a word or there's a door clapping or somebody is screaming loud, you can from there straight into shock and shut down. Yeah, so you, you probably know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, so you can go from, from immobili immobilization as well into a fight flight state. Yeah, so somebody is clapping the door and then you get upset about somebody's being loud because you just want to meditate and then just like, can't I have just like five minutes quiet? <laughs> <laughs> just like you're disturbing my peace <laughs> so screaming shouting getting angry and expressing it um, and then try to go back in immobilization good luck <laughs> so so you see that on the arrows you can go easily out of them but you can't go from these two spaces back into immobilization when you are in shock and faint and collapse place you can go, of course, back and fight flight. Um, but you can go from this shutdown space into mobilization. And this is all kind of therapies. You know, any kind of emotional expressive therapies of kind of uh, emotional release work. Um, um, uh, healing your parents on the cushion. Um, uh, uh having having a bicycle accident and uh, uh having somebody else guiding you through this process uh of getting back on the bike being mobile so so there's any kind of therapeutic approaches are going from the shock faint collapse trauma experience into mobilization so this is literally a therapeutic path here and then, of course, you can go from mobilization into fight, flight, and back and forth. But that goes more like over social engagement. And an example is for when you see kind of um, uh, a sport match, you know, you think they play, but this is more fighting or more working. Yeah. And somebody is violating a rule, somebody's violating an and dynamic that's going on and they have this fight going on till one person said hey i'm sorry there was a mistake so there's a reparation immediately and then they go back can go back and play if there is no reparation if there is no um uh, co-regulation about the dynamic the fight response will remain yeah so it's important piece so between mobilization and here so people can shift there so now the most important piece is between social engagement and mobilization and only on the safe side of that thing there's a hybrid state and that hybrid state includes literally all three here so that you can communicate and you can go in action at the same time and making choices about the situation you want to have. Or when you are in a place of relaxation, in, in immobilization, you can still talk and can say what you feel. You can still express what's going on in your sympathetic nervous system and in your social engagement system. So they are all three connected at the same time. And how that happens is through your noticing brain. This is what we're training when we're doing that with the hands. We're bringing our attention to what we notice. And this is what the, what the um, awareness training is literally is. So the more you do that, the more you have connection on this side of the nervous system, on the safe side. And um, the last one is that this is why I love that so much. So that in that hybrid state, this is where you literally make the decision and the choices about what's going to happen, who is doing the action, who is the action for, 
for how long, where is it going to happen? So all the parameter there needs to be in place to create an environment that is transformative. And this hybrid state only exists on the safe side of the nervous system between social engagement, engagement and mobilization. This hybrid state doesn't exist anywhere else in the body. So that's the only part in the nervous system. And this hybrid state is the core function of being playful, experiencing sensuality, and being capable of going into any um, sensual or sexual encounter in a playful way. Because there's no performance here. There is no um, um, approval. It's just, it's, it's, it's a state of play. And when it comes to relationship and connection, this is where I would say most people um, uh, desire to live their life. But I think most people, I, just can't, I think I can move that, I can, but most people live their life on this side of the nervous system. They both exist. You're either safe or you're not safe. Was it easy to digest, easy enough? When you are very much in the, you know, when you have the, vis, the, the, the system in, in front of your eyes right now, and uh, Agneta was talking about the right lower corner, and what you're talking about right now is the left corner in the system. And the left corner is that where we don't say no if other people want to do what they want. Yeah. So it's um, it's this place of enduring, is this place of going along with what is happening, is this place of saying yes to everything and feeling like a dormant about what is happening. Um, um going along with other people's actions and not believing that we have a choice about what is happening and this is um most of the time um because we have all been touched against our will before we could speak and that's true for each and one of us and that has happened in the first year of existence before our social engagement system has been created before we could speak yeah and we learn over the years, the first year, second, third, fourth, and so on, we learn that it has more priority what other people do to us than how we feel about it. And because of that, we think this is the way how we have to be. So we're putting this conditioning layer on our behavior and then we shut down because this is the way how it is. So when this is happening and we're putting ourselves into this position, it's not wrong or bad, it's a survival mechanism. Yeah, It's a, it's a level of hide and shut down somehow in between when you look at from the polyvagal theory. What this is attracting is the other side of the system, what is the perpetratory dynamic people in shadow who knows they can do everything to people who don't say no, the bully, the tyrant, the person who taking advantage of other people's weakness who can't say no. Yeah? So that means that when you in this one corner of the shadow, you will attract other people on the other side. Till you literally say on one point, whenever something is happening to you that you clearly know, well, there is no permission, so then don't do it. So that you speak up from, from, from a place of autonomy and agency and be really radical clear about if there's no permission given, then this is a no and go and fuck off. So that you use your, your expression of your emotions, so your anger, 
for determine your boundaries by saying stop and no, go the fuck away. This is easy, easier said than done. So I have been in America quite a lot and working with women there where I, where I start saying it that way. And they looked at me with eyes big like that. And they said, just like, you know, you know, Matt, it's really dangerous saying no. And it's easier going along and letting happen than actually fighting against it. I could not see that from my perspective because I'm white. I'm male, I'm 1 meter 90 tall, I have 90 kilos, I'm athletic, and if somebody is crossing my boundaries, what actually happens very rarely, they have to be really taking care that I'm not actually telling them off and very clearly. Yeah. So I'm in a position of privilege and I have no understanding how that must feel for somebody in a weaker position saying no. You know, this is, it, it's the hardest thing when, when your nervous system is switching on the not safe side and you're literally in fight flight response, but you have learned it's not okay to run away or to fight because it's dangerous. The only thing your nervous system is coming up with is the free state. And this, you know, this is not like one, two, three minutes or seconds. It happens like that. It's a completely switch. And what you need to know is here that when this switch is happening, that your capacity in your brain, in your frontal lobe, in your neocortex, your speech center is literally switched off and you don't have the capacity to say no. Yeah, I, You know, when you said that, I, have, I had a, a recurring dream for many years. And the dream is that I needed to scream and to shout while I was dreaming. And it was like as if I had a like a clops in my throat and I could not get my sound out. It's just like, you know, it's just like you, you, this thing is switched off. But what that does is when you, when you are aware of that, you can train that. You can do that in small steps. For example, and I don't know if that's appropriate here, but I just want to give it a try if you would like that, that you can say from your guts as much as you like, um, um, no, how would I say that? Would that be helpful for you if you could say here right now on the camera um, something like, don't touch me, take your hands off, or um, any, anything that, that, that you could say from your guts that you would have liked to say when he was hugging you. Yeah. You, you know what comes in my mind, and then Agneta is, is yours. There is this movie with um, Robert De Niro, I think it's Taxi Driver. It's, it's from the 80s or 70s. So he's standing in front of the mirror with his gun, so, so he's just like doing workout and just like, I don't, he just trains to become a, you know, tough guy and he's standing in front of the mirror and just like, are you talking to me? Are you fucking talking to me? Are you talk, are you talking to me? Yeah, so even just, just for fun, just, just, you know, the situation with this person hugging you, so what is it that you really would like to have said and say it the way how you wanted to have said it? And do that a few times just for yourself that you literally, it's, it's like you're just training yourself in that way, just like, just don't hug me, go away. I'm not, I'm, I'm just like, I have not heard you asking me or whatever you need to say, find your formula. Yeah. Yeah, and and we all know that survival oppression is a is a real thing, you know, specifically when we are in a position of less power, and and then it's actually good to <laughs> behave like that, you know. Uh, so so uh, if you, I had a teacher in the past who told me, 
don't have a confrontation with a um, with a concrete truck. Yeah, so it's like you just get out of the way. And if you say just like, okay, I need to go to the bathroom, or I need to just like get out now, or, or it's really late, or something like that, then it doesn't really matter what the uh, excuse. So uh, I have made a video of that. Well, now we have a video and I will post it in the academy, but there is in the foundation course, a video that I've made about the polyvagal theory. So please feel free to have a look there. Um, and I have as well on my YouTube channel, Somatic Consent on YouTube, there is a video about polyvagal theory. So when you look that up, um, kind of there's some material. If you want to have a look again or share that with other people, please feel free. All right. So thanks for joining today. See you on Wednesday or next week, Monday. And uh, have a beautiful evening and bye for now. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.